Hello, welcome to Leftist Labor History. My name is Nate, I am your host, and this is the first episode. So last time I did a, a brief introduction about what this series is and what I'm trying to do with this series, and today we're going to get into history. So. We're starting at the beginning of American labor. We're going back to 1492. A lot of institutions that we are currently living through, a lot of ideas, a lot of ideology, a lot of our, specifically a lot of our ideas about labor and the relationship between people who work and people who own property. A lot of this stuff, um, can be traced back to the era of transatlantic slavery. So we're going to go back to 1492, um, not because that, strictly speaking, not because that's the uh, first time that people from Europe and people from the Americas made contact, but because that is the beginning of transatlantic slavery. Um, slavery in this episode, I'm going to be using as a bit of an umbrella term, um, American slavery doesn't mean any one thing. So slavery for our purposes is going to be a, a form of coerced labor. And as much as possible, I'm going to try to um, be more specific when I'm when I'm speaking about the different types of coerced labor that have occurred um, over the course of, you know, over the last 500 years. Um, of American history. Um, and we're going back to 1492 also because typically, when I say American in this context, I mean encompassing both American continents. Um, and, and that's part of the reason why I want to go back to uh, Columbus's first expedition. So in 1492, like I said, that marks the beginning of transatlantic slavery because Christopher Columbus, on his first expedition, he um, enslaved a number of, of Taino people and brought them back to Spain uh, to to work as enslaved people. He did a few more expeditions, um, you know, over the next several years, and. At first, the Spanish crown uh, tolerated slavery, but but the king and queen of Spain were not keen on that idea. And so in 1500, just eight years after that first expedition, they made slavery illegal. Um, there were ways around that, right? So there are loopholes. And one of those systems was uh, called the encomienda system or the repartimiento system. And what that meant was that, um, so encomienda uh, translates to uh, tribute. What that meant was Spanish um, conquistadors, for lack of a better term, would go and find uh, Native American villages and they would, they would, you know, sack the village and enslave the people and declare that um, the, the village was part of the Spanish kingdom. Now it's like a feudal version of, of enslaving, um, native Americans without calling it slavery. The Spanish crown is, is unhappy with this system as well. Um, and they make efforts to close up those loopholes again in 1540 it's still difficult to enforce. And so slavery uh, in Spanish North America, in Spanish Latin America, in, in Spanish Central America, it, it continues. Um, even though, um, you know, Spain has officially declared it illegal. That's out of bounds. Um, getting into the late uh, 1500s and the early 1600s, um, Spanish settlers have moved into what is into Mexico, which at the time Mexico goes up the, the entire West coast of uh, North America. That's going to become the United States. And so 
I, I wanted to point that out because the Native American slavery was practiced prior to um, prior to the enslavement, the mass enslavement of African people who were abducted and brought to uh, British North America. So my source for this is a book called The Other Slavery, which was published just in the last couple of years by a historian named um, Andres Resendez. And in order to make this case, so, so to give you a sense of the scale of this, so he estimates somewhere between two and a half million to five million Native American peoples were, people were enslaved um, in North America from 1492 up into the 1900s. Um, but to use, in order to make that claim, he does use a, a rather expansive um, definition of slavery, which includes things like encomiendas, the encomienda system. Uh, it also includes debt peonage. So forcing somebody to work with you by putting them in your debt and saying, oh, you have to, you have to work for me to pay off your debt to me. Um, convict leasing is another form of, of slavery that he's including in this definition. Convict leasing is just what it sounds. Um, so you imprison somebody, you convict them of a crime, and now they're forced to work for you because they're prisoners. Um, so convict leasing as you may know, it continues to be a practice in the United States. Uh, incarcerated people are forced to work. If we fast forward to 1619, which might be a date that you're familiar with because of the New York Times 1619 project, um, this is the introduction of enslaved uh, people of African descent into British North America, specifically the colony of Virginia which had been founded in 1607. If you're a British person in the colony of Virginia in 1619, there's a lot of things that are going to happen that you really have no way of predicting. Um, you don't know that the British North America is going to British North America is going to survive at all. You don't know that um, enslaved African people, people of African um uh, ancestry are going to become the primary labor force that's going to build the United States um, into what will become, you know, hundreds of years later, a global superpower. Um, there's there's a number you don't know that that so at this point blackness and whiteness does not exist in the way that we understand it. Anti-black racism does not fully exist. Um, and, and frankly, there's probably not many indications that are going to let you know what is about to happen with the institution of transatlantic slavery. Well, just to, just to fully give you some context, um, Virginia in 1619, you know, Virginia for the first several, you know, three or four decades of its existence was a death trap. And the only way that that colony survived, the only way that the New England colony survived was just a massive influx of immigrants from England. So what's happening in England in the 1600s is there's a population boom. So a lot of the people who are going to North British North America are quote unquote sur surplus population. These are people that England is not prepared to take care of. So they're living on the streets. They're um, they're starving. They're engaged in petty crime, and England sees this as a problem. So right, this is this is still kind of feudalistic mercantilist, you know, transitioning into mercantilism, um, England, and they don't, the, the, the economy is not set up to take care of the number of people that are, are being born. One of the, one of the ways that they deal with, uh, this problem of overpopulation in England is to say, we need you in Virginia. What you can do is 
you know, we'll pay your way to go to America and you'll work for five or seven or 10 or 12 years. And at the end of that period, you will have paid off your debt for the voyage and you will get your own little plot of land. Isn't that great? Um, and if you're a, a, a pauper in England, in 17th century England, you're thinking, well, um, you know, I might die over there. I might never see my family again or whatever. But hey, it's better than starving on the streets or, you know, going in and out of jail. Um, and so a lot of people, a lot of men, by the way, so overwhelmingly the population is, is, is young men. Um, they're going over to Virginia and they are dying. They are dropping like flies. The settler colonialist fa fairy tale that we're all told is that, um, you know, th this is, this is very racist. This is a very racist way of looking at things, but the story we're told is that, you know, what European civilization was superior. And so Europe just had to show up and avenge. And then they are going to take over the American continents. I mean, that's just inevitable. That could not be farther from the truth. If there weren't, you know, armies of poor English people starving on the streets to flood these settlements, it wouldn't have survived. Um, I also want to point out, <laughs> in the perspective of, of, of the American Indians who were living there, these English people were hopeless. They didn't know how to catch fish. They were, they couldn't grow corn. And even if they could grow corn, they were choosing not to because, um, they, their, their whole point is to grow tobacco as a cash crop. So they're not, they're not planting squash and corn. They're planting tobacco while they're starving. And so if you're, if you're one of the Roanoke Indians looking at this, you're just like, what the hell is going on? These people are, are dying. And like, and even with lots of help from the Indians, I mean, there, there are periods of, of, uh, conflict and warfare, but there are also periods where Indians are trying to help the English settlers who are, who are displacing them and trying to take over the land. And it's, and it's not going well. And it's going to be until uh, uh, until about the 1640s before the population begins to stabilize. So who's who is doing the work then at this point in time? Mostly up until 1619, um, mostly and beyond 1619, mostly it is English uh, servants, indentured servants. And um, life expectancy is so low that it is cheaper to pay for, you know, some servant to come over and say like, Hey, yeah, I promise, you know, you'll get your land or whatever after you work off your indenture. It's cheaper to pay for their voyage over and have them die, you know, three or five or seven years into it than it is to buy an enslaved person, which is more expensive. Um, at this same time, so sugar plantations in the Caribbean are using exclusively enslaved people, even though the mortality rate is just as high. And the reason for that is that sugar is an awful, awful crop to, um, to, to harvest, to grow and to, and to harvest. And frankly, the only way that they could get people to grow sugar cane was to, to force them to get enslaved people to work these plantations. And again, six to eight years is the average life of, of somebody who is growing sugar cane in the Caribbean. Um, but in Virginia, where you have an option of indentured servants from England or enslaved Africans, it doesn't make financial sense to use enslaved people until about 1660, um, when life expectancy starts to get a little bit longer. There also was, so English settlers also tried um, to force Native Americans to work for them, and they were not in a position to, to be telling Native Americans what to do. 
and if you if they were able to get you know to get man to manage to you know capture a Roanoke Indian person and and force them to work on their plantation, he just runs away, and then there's nothing you can do. Um, so that does not work out as a labor scheme for British North America in the same way that it works for uh, Spanish America. So we're at about 1660. And um, the, the population of enslaved African people in Virginia is growing. Um, but as the population begins to stabilize and as people are living longer, you get more and more English indentured servants who are saying, hey, I've done my seven years or my 10 years or 12 years or five years or whatever it is, whatever the agreement is. Hey, I've done my labor. Where's my land? The colony of Virginia is running out of land um, because Native Americans are running the show. They are thriving in this uh, in this environment that they've cultivated over however many generations. And English people are just not able to displace them because they don't have the numbers and they don't have, you know, they're not able to hold their settlements even if they wanted to. So this begins to become a problem for the uh, the the English you know noble people who are who are the governors of, of the colony, um, and it, it reaches ahead in 1676 with uh, Bacon's rebellion. So uh, this guy this guy Nathan Bacon. So Bacon rounds up a bunch of of servants and slaves. So. So there's a difference between a slave and a servant at this point. Um, um, people of African ancestry are the only ones who are slaves, strictly speaking. But being an African American at this point does not mean that you can't be free and have rights. But the 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 conditions that they're working in are are similar enough that. Uh, Bacon's Rebellion is a coalition of servants and slaves. So it's a, it's a coalition of white and black people who team up together um, with a common goal. Well, what they do is they go and attack uh, an Indian village. And then they go and burn down the governor's mansion because the governor is not allowing people to expand into Indian territory. So... The, so England has an alliance with uh, North American Indians that's going to go through, uh, you know, 1776. So we're in 1676 with Bacon's Rebellion. We're going to jump ahead a little bit to 1705. 1705 is when Virginia passed its so-called slave codes. And at this point, this is the first um, instance in British North America in the colonies where they have now officially declared people of African um, ancestry to be to not have rights. This didn't come out come out of nowhere. This was you know. Uh, this kind of developed over a century. I mean, this is a difficult thing to to properly frame, but the point I'm trying to get at, the point I'm driving at is that this is this is a huge, huge deal for the state to enslave an entire population based on their ancestry. So I also want to note, this this canard, which is it's frankly this propagand propagandistic notion that you know people simply didn't know better. Well, we know you know going back to 1500 when Spain tried to when Spain outlawed American slavery. So we can go back further to 14th century France, where the French Constitution at the time said that slavery was not allowed on French soil. And the reason for that was that French sailors were being impressed into service by um, Arab traders in the, in the Mediterranean. And so France was like, no, we don't like this when it happens to us, you know. 
Um, when France tries to establish colonies in Saint-Domingue to grow sugar cane, then it becomes a uh, very... And then they're, you know, splitting hairs and like, well, is this French soil technically? Um, and of course, uh, the, the plantations, you know, survive in Jamaica and Saint-Domingue, which would become Haiti. Um, Quakers in Pennsylvania in as early as 1680 were organizing resistance to um, slavery. Um, the, the awful conditions on sugar plantations make, you know, the news of that makes its way to England and to Western Europe. And uh, English people are boycotting sugar at, at one point in the 18th century. You know, slavery was a very contentious uh topic during the framing of the Constitution. It was not allowed in Pennsylvania. So, okay, so George Washington, just to give a sense of the kind of the stakes that are involved and the opposition to uh, slavery, George Washington owned slaves at the time that he was president. And uh, the capital at the, at, when he was president at first was in Philadelphia. Pennsylvania has outlawed slavery. Um, George Washington is allowed to bring enslaved people to the capital in Philadelphia, but he takes advantage of a loophole. So you're, you are allowed to hold an enslaved person for six months, after which, after six months, you have to free that person. So George Washington takes his enslaved people back to Virginia every six months while he's president in order to skirt this law that rather than freeing his, uh, you know, rather than giving these enslaved people um, their freedom, he's continued to hold, to ab abduct them and, and keep them enslaved. So, so 1770s, 1780s, Slavery is, is a contentious issue, and, you know, northern, and, and during this era, uh, the northern states are individually beginning to outlaw the practice of slavery. So by about the turn of the 19th century, um, Europe is beginning to also outlaw slavery. They're definitely going to profit off the, produ the products of slavery, uh, particularly cotton, going into the 19th century. Um, and in fact, in 1807, the United States bans the importation of enslaved people. Um, the enforcement is a little bit lax, but for the most part, um, this, this ends um, more or less the, the, the trafficking of enslaved people from the west coast of Africa to British North America. Um, you might be thinking, wait a minute, uh, the Civil War is not going to happen until 1861. You're absolutely right. We've got 50 more years of the institution of slavery, even after the United States banned its importation. Um, and the, and it, even with the South, you know, more or less, uh, you know, abiding by that, um, the, 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 the United States economy relies on uh, slave labor for 50 some odd more years. Um, so even with this overwhelming opposition to the institution of slavery, something happens in 1797. If you've taken history in high school in the United States, you have heard of uh, Eli Whitney. He invented the cotton gin. Isn't that great? That's this, you know, that that kicks off the American in Industrial Revolution. <clears throat> hey, buddy. Uh, plantations in in the southern United States are growing uh, tobacco for sure, rice, indigo, cotton to a certain extent, but is not yet cane cotton. And the cotton gin, what it does, um, so, so the, the cotton bowls are physically very difficult. They're difficult to pick 
for starters. They're hard and they're sharp. And they're going to stab your fingers and cut them all to hell. Um, and then once you have these bowls of cotton picked, you have to break open the hard bowls. You have to extract the cotton fibers from these pods and they're covered in sap and there's a there's tiny little seeds in the cotton fibers so to get cotton to where it is a usable thing you have to extract it's a very arduous um painful process if you're doing it manually and the cotton gin automates that well on the one hand yeah uh, uh enslaved people are no longer doing that by hand but the cotton gin and, you know, other kind of technological developments that are, you know, it's becoming easier to transport goods. Um, there's other diplomatic political developments, um, such as the Louisiana, Louisiana Purchase that allows for this. But cotton is about to explode. When you say slavery, you just, Lou, be quiet. Hey, don't do that. Really, so after, you know, 200 some years of having, uh, you know, exploiting the, the labor of enslaved African people in British North America is when we're going to get to King Cotton and cotton plantations. And I think what people think when you just say slavery, I think a lot of people think of a row of enslaved people, you know, in, in, a, in a coffle connected by chains and they're you're moving down these rows of cotton, hunch, you know, picking cotton, hunched over. Um, this is one specific era and one specific instance in a long, long history of institu institutionalized slavery. Something else that, that might come up in your mind's eye is a guy riding a horse, you know, carrying a gun or a bullwhip. And that's the overseer. And his job is to torture people and to make them work harder and faster. And to make sure that they don't ask for anything and don't expect anything. And all they can do is just pick cotton faster and harder. And, um, you know, there's evidence that subjecting people to this kind of violence, whipping them, torturing them, maiming them if they, you know, misbehave um, or, you know, just w whipping them or torturing them because they are not continually picking more and more cotton. This is this is increasing the output of of cotton from um, from the, the American South that you may be thinking, well, what happens to the population of uh, enslaved black people in the United States after 1807, when now it's illegal to um, abduct people from Africa? Well, the population continues to increase. So it's pretty obvious how that happens is, um, you know, sexual abuse has been a, a, a tool of, of control for slaveholders going, you know, going back to 1492. The slaveholders' interest in the reproduction of the people that they've enslaved takes on a new significance. So they are forcing people to reproduce. Um, rape is... is, is part of the foundation of the United States economy at this point. Um, anyway, so I, I mean, it's awful, right? So just to, just to kind of recap where we've gotten by, you know, 1840, 1850 is this is absolutely hell on earth. These are torturous conditions. Um, just, I mean, it's hard to fathom anything, you know, it's, 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 uh, anyway, anyway, you get into the Civil War, and in 1862, um, Abraham Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation. This is a wartime tactic, and it works. It works beautifully, but the, the, um, the rationale for the Emancipation Proclamation is to encourage enslaved people 
who are in the South to abandon their plantations. And this prompts what W.E.B. Du Bois, who is a, a historian who uh, Du Bois characterizes what happens after the, emancip- after the Emancipation Proclamation as a general strike. And in, in numbers, um, enslaved black people in the South walk off their plantations, they escape, they engage in, you know, they're emboldened by this proclamation. They think the end of slavery is actually going to happen. And that gives them the nudge nudge to resist um, the Southern economy. Lincoln did, you know, Lincoln did not free the slaves. Lincoln did not win the Civil War. I mean, you know, people would kind of split hairs on Du Bois' characterization of this as a general strike, but this really turned the tide of the Civil War. Abe Lincoln, why would he pick a Southern Democrat to be his running mate and his vice president, right? Um, the answer is to appeal to, you know, whatever kind of Southern voters he thinks he can peel off, but also because Andrew Johnson is is a, a poor person from Tennessee, and Andrew Johnson hates uh, the wealthy plantation owners. And so that's that's their kind of common ground here, right? Even though Lincoln does not, Lincoln hates the idea of slavery. He is not fond of black people and does not believe that black people have a place in um, in the United States, right? So his plan, so his uh, plan falls in line with other people who, are not abolitionists, but favor anti-slavery, which is, yes, free enslaved people and get them out of our society, you know, uh, send them back to Africa. Remember, at this point, we've got 250 years of, of, of African people, um, people of, of African descent living in the United States, in North America, right? There is no back to Africa for a lot of these people. At this point, especially since the importation, you know, the importation of enslaved people ended in 1807. So, so one other thing I want to say, so by, okay, we've, we've gone from 1492 to 1865. What has changed, right? So in 1619, we've got enslaved uh, African people in the colony of Virginia in 1705, Black people now are officially of second class status in Virginia on the books, codified 1807. The importation of enslaved people is is banned. And by 1861, when we're when Southerners are fighting the uh, the uh, the Civil War, there's a lot more white people who are in Andrew Johnson's position than there are wealthy planters, plantation owners. Um, And when I say in his position, I mean in his socioeconomic position. You have a lot of people who really, realistically, do not ever stand to materially benefit from the institution of plantation slavery, going off and fighting and dying for slavery. What is that about? Well, in the, um, you know, in the, in the 250 years since slavery has been around in British North America, it's built up an ideology. It is built up around it a culture and a way of being and a value and most significantly anti-black racism. Racism is what is propelling these poor white people to go off and die in the bloodiest war that the world had seen to that point. Um, they are not, they're not, they're not benefiting. They themselves are not benefiting economically from the institution of slavery. That's a really, that's a significant thing, right? I want to impress upon you the extent to which slavery the the what you know on its on its very surface is is 
a material relationship or a relationship of, of labor between a person and um, a slaveholder. This has taken such deep roots into the psyche of the southern United States, to a lesser, to a lesser extent, the northern United States. But this has become such a way of life that people, poor people, are going to war and dying for it. So with that, um, my battery's about to die, and I've been talking for a long time. We're going to wrap up this episode, and uh, please join us next time for Reconstruction. Thanks. Bye.